Hi, folks. <clears throat> it's Matt Hillen from DCEO. I just wanted to introduce um, our host today. Andrea messing Matthew is with the Northern Illinois University uh, Center for Educational Systems. She um, has been uh, the largest part of uh, creating uh, this uh, NOFO that, that or notice of funding obligation uh, that you see um, before you for this um, youth career pathways effort. Uh, just wanted to acknowledge the fact that this is new to everybody. Um, we're doing a, a very new uh, process for this funding opportunity that we haven't done before for youth funds. Um, a lot of what you see coming out of uh, DCEO and out of the core partners under WIOA is going to look a lot more like this. I wanted to make sure to establish that. Um, we do uh, acknowledge this is the first time. There's going to be uh, some confusion. Folks, um, you know, shouldn't hesitate to ask questions as you go um, and give us feedback uh, because this is, um, you know, like I said, this is this is a new process for us. Uh, we also will acknowledge that we're doing this new process at an unavoidably difficult time because we are also, um, you know, entering the, the realm of, of GATA, or the, the um, Grant Accountability and Transparency Act, which is making applying for our grants different as well. So those two things are not linked. I wanted to let you know there is, um, you know, the GATA process that will happen for every grant from here on out. Um, and, and the new regulations that we have to deal with under GATA. And then there is uh, the program-specific stuff, which is this uh, funding opportunity for Youth Career Pathways, which we are uh, embedding with, um, you know, with, with a lot more uh, intentionality towards um, career pathway program design um, and the best practices that were distilled by the uh, Illinois Workforce Innovation Board's Youth Task Force. Uh, with all of that, I will turn it over to Andrea to get us started. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everybody. It's Andrea. Um, so thanks so much for taking the time to join us for the webinar today. Um, I recognize this is a shift, but due to some potentially dangerous weather conditions which have not materialized, um, we decided to turn this into a webinar. And I hope, given the busy holiday season, that that was okay for everybody. Um, I'll say this, this is likely going to be an interactive webinar, um, and so I'm going to be looking for some participation from everybody. So even though we've asked you to mute your speakers, your audio, um, or at least your phone while you're not talking, I'm going to have you unmute them frequently. Um, and uh, I want to make sure that this is as interactive as a webinar can possibly be. Given that we can't see each other's faces, there's always a little bit lost there. I also wanted to acknowledge um, Brian Richard with the Center for Governmental Studies at NIU. He is um, one of my counterparts at NIU who's going to be working on evaluation um, and helping us think through evaluation for this particular um, funding opportunity. One thing that is likely going to come up as a big question mark for a lot of you as we spend time talking today is how are we going to be evaluating this? Um, and we're going to spend some time talking about that, but um, I want you to understand before we start that many of the evaluative structures are going to be built as we're doing the grant. So a little bit of um, kind of building the ship while we're already starting to sail it. Um, and part of that is because this is a very new type of funding opportunity, and this is an opportunity for Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity to reevaluate how they themselves evaluate programs. And so to a certain extent, those grantees that end up being part of this grant, um, they will be approximately 8 to 12, um, will be co-creating an evaluative structure with us. So I want you to keep that, that kind of framework and lens in mind as we spend time talking today. This is going to be very different from what you're used to, um, and that's with real intentionality um, as we kind of try to rethink how we can be creative in this very complicated career pathway space. So I'm going to spend some time um, going through the agenda real quick, and then please note that if there are questions along the way, um, you can either raise your hand, um, throw them in the chat box, or, or just say, can I interrupt for a second? Um, there's not that many of us. I think there's approximately 10, 12 of us. Um, so we can make this really conversational, and I, and I hope everyone takes the opportunity to do that. Um, so just to walk through the um, 
the agenda real quick. Um, I have this blocked out until 4. Um, given the webinar format, I speculate that we'll probably end early, um, which probably won't be a bad thing for, for all of you. So we're going to start with introductions, and this is where I'm going to have you unmute your phones because I want to hear what it is you're doing um, and where, where this opportunity might help to work with or align or reinvigorate or be innovative in the work that you do. Um, then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about kind of setting the stage and uh, establishing the action. And if one of, if someone, because um, I can hear myself speaking, okay, I think someone, just keep in mind if you're talking on the phone, you need to make sure that your computer speakers are muted. If you have them both on, there's going to be feedback. Um, then we'll spend some time talking about some specific expectations of the NOFO, the funding opportunity, and the logic model. And then we'll actually walk through the toolkit in detail. Um, there will also be um, so a lot of time for questions and answers. I've blocked out kind of some, some specific time for questions and answers. But if we find that we're just walking through them along the way, then um, we'll be a little less stringent on that agenda point. Um, there's also going to be about 15 minutes. Um, and this is where kind of the cross-webinar networking is going to take place. And I, I know this is going to be weird. Um, because this is probably not the type, typical type of webinar that you're used to, but this is where I hope that folks will speak up and say, I heard so-and-so talking about this that they do, and I'd like to follow up with them on X. So this is kind of where we're going to do a little bit of a round table and, and talk about where we're finding things in the for our opportunity in alignment and commute across communities. Um, and then the last thing, and this is something that Matt and I realized after the first technical assistance session that we really had to do is we want to build a, a, an FAQ that we can post on the website. And, and part of the technical assistance slash listening sessions that we're doing, and this webinar is one of them, is about building that frequently asked questions. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions about funding, about how funding can be used. So as you're contemplating questions, please keep in mind that if you have the question, there's a high likelihood that someone else does too. Um, and we encourage you to um, we can encourage you to really ask those questions openly so that we can start to build a frequently asked questions section on the website. Um, okay, any questions up front before we go ahead and get started? No? Okay. So we're going to shoot right into introductions. And I'm literally just going to go down the line um, and start with Christina. And basically, I just want to do very quickly, name, organization, but also can what role do you play vis-a-vis -vis your organization and how does your work intersect with opportunity use? And what do you hope that this pilot funding opportunity will do and or enable for opportunity use? And Christina, since you're first on the line of participants, I'm going to go ahead and let you get started. Hello? All right, Christina, we'll come back to you. Um, David Vaughn, how about you? Can we go ahead and start with you? Okay. Um, so David says he's not on the phone. Um, so you can I ask this question? Can David speak through the computer? Um, David, if you have a um, microphone on your computer, you can um, use that. We have enabled that for participants or anyone else. Okay. Why don't we go in and, and um, move on to Destiny um, in LWEF 13? Okay. Um, is there anyone on the phone um, who is able or, uh, or on the computer who has microphone access that can go ahead and speak up? Hello. No. Hello. Hi. Who is speaking? Mirage Patel. Hi, go ahead. 
Um, my question had to do with the uh, registered Prana shop. Um, there is a project. Mirage, I think we lost you. Hello, this is Ray Fleming. Can you hear me? Can you understand me? Hi, Ray. Hi, Ray. Go ahead. Okay, hi. I'm with Community Youth Development Institute, actually in Chicago. Um, I missed the, the, the date in Chicago, so I was actually planning on driving uh, to you all. Uh, oh, thank so, you for having me do that. Yeah, my, so this, uh, the webinar actually works for me. However, I am a program director, uh, once again, with Community Youth Development Institute. So with, with our program, we also have an alternative high school where we deal a lot with the opportunity youth. And what we're trying to do is implement a construction program to help uh, maybe deconstruct and rehab some of the vacant and abandoned properties within the Inglewood community. We're, we're, we're located in the Inglewood community, which is a high-risk uh, community. Yeah. So I'm hoping that this type of funding will give us the opportunity to, um, to, to rehab, to purchase properties possibly, and to provide some vocational skills that the young people can gain uh, to allow them to enter into some of the registered apprenticeship programs. That's a very cool idea. And uh, what what register apprenticeship? You know, I was look. We're we're looking at all of them. You know, the laborers, the carpenters, um, the electric electrical uh, union. Okay. So are there apprenticeship programs in, in your area? Yes. Okay. All right. That's good to know. Okay. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Hello. Yes. Who's this? Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Seth El Jamal. Um, I uh, am a youth coordinator for Manufacturing Renaissance, and we are located in the Austin community. Um, my focus is engaging opportunity youth in um, advanced manufacturing training programs. Um, we're currently partnering with Jane Adams Resource Corporation to begin. Um, recruiting and uh, training um, opportunity youth for a cohort in uh, February. And we're building uh, that cohort after a few months, after five months of training, they will then be placed in, in jobs. So we want to focus um, on um, kind of broadening our scope and, uh, you know, uh, bolstering our outreach efforts as well as um, kind of creating a waiting list for this type of programming. Um, one of the biggest issues that we face is young, our young people are very capable and competent, but um, they trip themselves up um, on the, uh, the soft skills, you know, the sure. practice existing in another environment that they're not familiar with. Um, so my job specifically is to help train them in building those skills and kind of make sure that the company that they're working for also understands that they've hired a highly qualified young person, but this young person needs a bit of time, you know, more so than most, in order to catch up to that environment. Um, so we, we definitely are looking forward to um, working with you to, 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 to bolster our, our efforts in advanced manufacturing. So can I ask, when you said you, your, you, you yourself specifically are working with them on soft skills, what, yes. um, what tools are you using to help, help do that, to help facilitate that? Um, we've partnered with um, the Center for Neighborhood Technology, um, and they have literally come up with a curriculum um, called Equity Express that focuses on um, building um, an understanding of kind of the, the, the uh, uh, the, the structure of a corporate environment. We've also borrowed a lot from uh, Ruby K. Payne Framework for Understanding Poverty, and we've developed a curriculum actually that helps young people navigate the hidden rules in various cultures. Um, and also Jane Adams Resource Corporation has their own um, set of pre 
employment strategies to help our young people kind of build that level of understanding. The challenge is in the application, it's in the case sure. management, you know, so um, I'm also focused on that, you know, helping young people practice what they learned. Sure. Um, We've got a lot of tools to teach them, but it's you know day seventeen on the on the job is when they have to kind of pull out what they had in their what they have in their toolkit and apply it. Sure. Um, and sense. so that's kind of really the biggest issue. That makes sense. Okay. Do we have um, other folks that are are willing to share? Are oh, this Kathy? Hi there. Hey. Hi, let's start with Kathy. Go ahead, Kathy. Is this Kathy uh, Evans? I was in Lake College, actually. I think you were trying to talk to Christina Hutchison earlier, maybe, and I don't know if she cannot get on from her office okay. or she's That's not okay. in there. Uh, I'm the grant writer here at Rin Lake College. We had written last year for this, and uh, when this came out this year, we were going, hoping to kind of just uh, expand the model we were trying to work with last year uh, with our, some of our CTE programs. and. Uh, with career pathways maybe through the truck driving. I think we discussed CMA. We we're hoping to work with Youth Build and Mantracon down here, besides area corporations where we could uh, do some uh, internships or some type of agreement. Uh, we, are, we are a RAC college, but uh, the, I think the only thing we have a RAC agreement with is HIT, and I, I don't believe that would be one we'll be focusing on. I think it would be probably truck driving and CMA and some maybe some of our other shorter term links that we can, you know, we can start them on a pathway, uh, but these students have so many needs that we have to address that getting them into a huge program is very hard until we can get them started, you know. Uh, that's what we have addressed in the past is that they have a lot of issues that are not necessarily nothing to do with education, it's their home life, it's their uh, barriers they face that uh, some of our other students do not. So. Sure. That's, that's kind of our goal here, just to get them on a pathway and hopefully uh, maybe get us some kind of agreements. We did have some agreements with our last ones for uh, some training agreements with participating uh, area businesses, and we hope to start down that pathway again. And maybe Christine will be able to get on later. I'm in my office. I don't know. I know some of the other people here are having the trouble getting into uh, the phone system. So. Oh, no. Really? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, so, but that's kind of where we are here at Rin Lake. We will be applying again. I, I think our grant was well written last year and kind of well received, but we, I think it was a little off track, you know, so. Well, and, I, and I'll say this just as, um, and it's something that Matt can speak to as well. Um, for the grants that were sent in last year, it wasn't so much a matter of that they were poorly written. It was more that the emphasis on partnerships wasn't as, as, as robust as it needed to be, and part of that is because I think that there wasn't enough um, preparation and, and enough partnering ahead of time to make sure that, that some of that language was understood, and that's what we really tried to correct this time. And you'll you'll note when we're talking today that we're spending an awful lot of time talking about partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. Um, so that's that's going to be one of the things that we're really going to try to emphasize on. Um, so I look forward to spending more time talking to you um, about your your ideas. Um, Kate, I think that you you kind of were in the queue for next. Yes, hi there. Kate Green with the City of Peoria, Illinois. Um, we are actually uh, an innovation team here locally that has been tasked with kind of leveraging a pretty large infrastructure investment within our city to address combined sewers here locally. So we actually have raw sewage that's getting into the river, and we're looking at doing so using green infrastructure. Um, and it will be uh, over $200 million of investment in green infrastructure over the next 20 years. And so we know with that comes a great deal of maintenance that uh, needs to be in place, structures for that in place for the green infrastructure. So we're looking within those same communities that has our combined sewer, uh, what are some of the additional issues that we can address? And one of the big issues that came up for us uh, was opportunity use and knowing that there's a high population of that within these neighborhoods. So understanding how can we kind of leverage this investment and this need for maintenance and create a service learning core uh, that engages opportunity use and gives them the tools and the skills that they need, uh, emphasizing both those soft skills that have already been mentioned as well as some of those harder skills and those credentials that can get them on a pathway towards full employment. So that's what we're hoping to do here locally. Are there any partners that you're already working with on, on the ground in Peoria? 
There are. So we actually have many. Um, we're working with Illinois Central College on the education front. Um, several of our nonprofits will be serving as recruitment partners and as social service um, aides. We've been in discussions with CareerLink, and I know that um, Dave Vaughn is on the, on the line as well. And so we kind of have a wide range of, of partners um, in the queue. I should also mention uh, we have a pretty strong mentorship track as well, including our local senior corps who has signed on to be mentors, as well as um, a young professionals organization that is uh, partnered with our local United Way. Okay, that's great to hear. Um, is there someone else who'd like to speak up? Dave, if you're on the phone, we'd love to hear from you. You made it on the phone. Okay. Um, all right, I guess we'll leave it there for now. Um, I'd love okay. to have some more. Dave, is that you? No, it's actually John Mark Carroll from the Illinois oh, Department of Human Services, Division yeah. of Rehab. Thank you. Glad to hear from you. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to switch back and forth between my computer speakers that's, and that's all right. I was talking into them for a while, so I apologize. <laughs> all right, now I'm good. Okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I work for the Division of Rehabilitation Services, and I work in staff development um, and provide education training to our VR counselors, um, as well as work some within business relations as well. And I think something like this is really helpful for us too. We have um, obviously a um, the the individuals that we help range anywhere. Um, from as young as age 14 and a half with really no cutoff as far as age goes. They're all individuals who um, are interested in achieving an employment outcome. They have disabilities, so I think it's a pretty uh, good, uh, important group for this. Um, we have a huge amount of youth with disability that we actually have throughout our entire population, um, all throughout the state of Illinois. So. Um, in looking for different opportunities to uh, kind of continue on after they're transitioning out of high school where they are receiving a lot of pre-employment transition services um, and into typically their first job, um, this would be very helpful for us, I think. Um, a lot of them are receiving some of the soft skills and early on skills in entry-level positions. So I think our, our candidates that are youth with disabilities come equipped with um, a good amount of that, but there's always room for them to to improve and then get into entry level opportunities that they can build um, up higher into middle skills as time goes on. So this is an exciting opportunity for us as well. Great, this is uh, good to hear. Very exciting. Thank you. Um, is uh, Warnita available or Margo? This is Margo. Hi, Margo. Go ahead. Well, I'm just I'm with Renlake College as well, and I'm the dual credit coordinator. Um, so I get into the high schools, and I'm just going to kind of um, help the team build on where we were last year and see if we can't get something going for this coming year. Great. That's good to hear. Um, and we also have um, Juanita. She's available. Or Kim Wilkinson. All right. Is there anyone that would like to participate and send some shoot out some introductions that I haven't that I haven't heard from? Please speak up. Okay. So just so we can keep on moving, um, if it, if your capacity to, to speak up is um, is is changes, then um, and let me know. So I'm hearing from Kim that. She's not getting the mic to work. Um, I think, Kim, you may need to actually call in. I'm not sure if there's an issue with the, the microphone, um, but it may be worth um, just grabbing a phone and calling in. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of proceed from here, and then we will, um, we'll, we can always backtrack on some of those introductions. 
So, and Kim is from Run Lake College as well. So we have quite the Run Lake contingent um, at, in our group here. So um, let's just talk a little bit about the objectives of the, the Notice of Funding Opportunity, which I'll just call the opportunity for now because I don't love the, the acronym NOFO, um, but we'll just call it the opportunity for now. So by the end of the pilot period, and we're talking approximately 12 to 18 months, um, it's not been set in stone, but that's the approximate time frame we've, we've been working with as a target time frame. So by the end of that, that pilot period, um, the objectives of this of this opportunity are that the Department of Commerce will support approximately eight to 12 regional partnerships in Illinois that will develop um, those really innovative, regionally-based, cross-sector partnership programs. So what needs to be noted is that the number of regions will depend on really the quality, quantity, and location of the application. We recognize that this is a, a kind of a big and bulky application um, and that there's a lot of moving parts to this. And not everyone is going to be well positioned to work with partners to work on this. Um, and again, this is about partnerships and building partnerships across sectors. So this is not really the kind of opportunity that one organization is going to be able to just latch onto by itself. This is going to be the kind of thing that needs to be developed with partnerships in mind. Um, the second objective is that those cross-sector partnership programs will have provided multiple best practice models and outcome results for the development of continued funding support through WIOA Youth Funding. Um, one of the outcomes as a researcher that I'm hoping to see is that there are multiple best practice models that come out of this that we can actually use to identify exemplars of practice and, and really start to drill in is what makes some of these partnerships successful and what makes them less successful, kind of where are the fail points and where are the success points, and how can we highlight the success points and really start to think about how we scale those up going forward. Um, the third objective is that at least two employers in each regional program will have committed to providing future support. Um, it really cannot be overstated how valuable, intrinsically valuable, and um, fundamentally necessary employer engagement is in these program. Um, WIOA has really reoriented the language around employer engagement, and this is something we will be looking very strongly towards, is are there employers that have been engaged or are they part of that original design process so that they themselves have an equal voice in the work that's being done vis-a-vis -vis opportunity use as part of this grant. Um, that's something that we're really looking to make sure that at least two employers um, have committed to providing future support, and not just in funding, but really providing future um, human capital to the effort. And then this last fourth one um, is something different, and I think something we can spend a little time talking about today, and I'm happy to ask questions and answer questions about our thinking behind this. Um, but because we think that youth voice in this work is so crucial, um, what we're hoping to see, the objective, is that the youth ambassadors from each program will have met multiple times and have provided program feedback to the youth, Illinois Standing Youth Committee. Um, the importance of youth voice is incredibly intrinsically important to, um, to the work that's happening in opportunity use across the state and is, is crucial um, to the, the chair of the Illinois Standing Youth Committee, so we want to make sure that that's part of the work that we're proposing. So we're just going to go ahead and dive in. Um, We'll start by just setting the stage and defining career pathways. And, and I'll start by the outset to say that those of us at the agency and education level don't necessarily always agree on the common terms around career pathway definitions. And this is something that's very much a definition in flux. For the purposes of this, um, of this opportunity and the work that we're proposing going forward um, with WIOA, we're really focusing on the WIOA definition of career pathway. And what this means um, is really about that combination of rigorous, high-quality education, training, and services that does these specific things. And we can kind of talk about these in concert. Um, but if you kind of imagine um, a continuum, not necessarily one that occurs in a linear way, but imagine kind of the dots being connected across the lifetime of a student's work. Um, and kind of keep that vision in mind as we're talking about this. So those 
those combination of rigorous and high quality education training and services, they need to align with the skill needs of industries in the economy of the state or the regional economy involved. And why is this important? Because this is, the, as we contemplate career pathway system design, we need to think about what are the viable opportunities for students that they're able to take advantage of, particularly when they leave university, they leave a two-year college, or they leave a certification program. So if the skill needs of industries are not aligned um, with the economies, if the training programs themselves are not aligned with those skill needs of the economies in question, it does make it difficult for, for students to make those connections. Um, the combination of, of education, training, and services also needs to prepare an individual to be successful in any, any of a full range of secondary or post-secondary education options. When we talk about post-secondary education options, we're not only talking about kind of a four-year college situation. We're talking about stackable moments of credentialing and certification from a, a, a short-term credential to a baccalaureate to a master's degree. We're really talking about how preparing that student to be able to take advantage of and be successful in any one of those ranges and being able to stack one on top of each other so that as they gain skills, that those skills become meaningful for the next stage in their education. Um, it also means a combination of education, training, and services that include counseling to support that individual in achieving that person's education and career goals. And what that counseling looks like is likely going to be very different for different um, portions of the constituency that you're speaking to. Um, for someone who has a disability, that their, their counseling needs may be very diff different than someone who is facing homelessness. So there's, there's really thinking about how that nuance plays out and are you partnering with the right people to make sure that you're able to address the specific needs of, the, of your constituency. Um, it also means that, that the combination of education, training, and services includes, as appropriate, that education that's offered concurrently um, with and in the same context as workforce preparation activities um, and training for a specific occupation and occupational cluster. So when we're talking about this, we're really talking about that education is, is offered at the same time with workforce training, work-based work training activities. So are those actually happening in concert? It also organizes education, training, and other services to meet the particular needs of an individual in such a way that it accelerates the education and career advancement of that individual. Um, oh, and it's text twice there. Um, and that to the extent that it's, it's practicable, right? We don't want to drag out education for students. We don't want them duplicating their efforts. We want to make sure that whatever education we provide them, that it's done in a matter that's efficient and accelerated where appropriate um, so that students are able to, to take advantage of the most opportunities and maximize their time in and out of the classroom. We also are talking about um, that combination that enables an individual to attain a secondary school diploma as appropriate or its recognized equivalent, and at least one recognized post-secondary credential. So when we're talking about a post-secondary credential, this can be a short-term credential, this can be a long-term credential, it can be an apprenticeship, um, an associate, a baccalaureate, right? At least one that, that can be used to launch them into the next phase of their work. And then also, finally, it really focuses on helping an individual enter or advance within a specific occupation or occupational cluster. So if there's preparation for a specific occupational cluster like manufacturing, it allows that individual to enter into that but also to advance. So even though this, this definition is multifaceted, I think as we, if we contemplate the, the the array of opportunities and options available to students and the, the, the path that they generally take, and this is not always linear, it's often truncated, it's stopped, um, there's a lot of backtracking and forward movement. Um, if we contemplate those, those A through G, those kind of those, those definitional points, those elements, layered on top of that, I think we start to see what we're talking about. So the vision and theory of action, I'm going to walk through a few key pieces. Um, the first is really focused on career pathways. Um, and a career pathway system really emphasizes the connections between a learner-focused framework and a system-focused framework. So a learner-focused framework is really focused on this notion of progression. So as learners pro progress through an education program and into a career, there are three general aspects of career pathway development that need to be taken into consideration based on the work that we're doing here. And that's focused on work-based learning, 
through work-based learning opportunities, particularly those skills that enable people to grow in their work, um, foundational skills such as accountability, timeliness, and interpersonal skills, those skills that are really essential to developing workplace um, relationships with other people. And then finally, the continuation of education and training consistently to develop and continuously fine-tune those technical and academic skills which support both personal and those business development goals. Right? So there's a learner-focused framework that we're talking about. There's also a system-focused framework. And the system-focused framework requires several key elements to ensure long-term feasibility and inclusiveness. The first of those is ownership. The ownership, and when we're talking about this here, we're talking about ownership of local and regional programs by local actors that target participants with the supports that suit local needs and address the needs and requirements of the business community, working with providers and blending and braiding of public and private funds where appropriate from federal and state agencies and private sector investments. So this is really about local ownership, co-ownership, and co-creation of programs so that there is that kind of latch on to something that belongs to the community. There's also building capacity of local and regional actors to develop programs that are locally and regionally appropriate um, with the necessary intermediate, intermediary supports to ensure the continuation of programs. Um, and then finally, it's ensuring program sustainability through the blending of private and public funds where appropriate and the braiding of those funds where feasible. Um, as we're contemplating and addressing youth needs, I think it's really incumbent for all of us, upon all of us, to think about two key factors. Um, because developing a career pathway system that's appropriate for opportunity use requires the assessment of these factors. One is their degree of preparation for work or education, and two is their ability to take advantage of that opportunity. And I think that this next slide actually does a better job than this first one. I think these two in, in concert really work better, but I couldn't quite figure out how to get them on the same page. As you contemplate, um, a kind of a four-part typology um, of where you might identify obstacles, challenges, lost points, and opportunities that allow communities to determine critical needs and the types of support required, I think this, this allows you to examine that. So if you imagine a student that has a high degree of preparation, um, perhaps they've had high school or they've had better education, perhaps they've had some college, but they have obstacles outside of education that create a low ability to take up opportunities. Their needs are going to look very different than someone who has a low degree of preparation and a low degree of ability to take up opportunities. Perhaps they have less than high school education, but they're, they're, fight, they're facing multiple hurdles and they're finding themselves unable to transition. Um, and they're going to need a very different set of supports than that student that maybe already has high school or better education. And they do have a high ability to take up opportunities, but they're somehow just mismatched. They've somehow not yet found their way. Um, and I think that that's really important as we contemplate how students might find themselves unable to move forward, even if they themselves have the preparatory um, background that would lead you to think that they would be able to. Right? They may have a high school graduate. They may have a high school diploma. And they have enough preparation for work to have marketable skills, but they just can't, they can't move forward and they need some additional assistance. Right? So as we contemplate, if you look at the opportunity use you're trying to serve, if it's in one particular subset, are you working with, the, with partners that are able, that enable you the opportunity to give those students the, um, to address their needs in a really comprehensive way. If you're working with opportunity use that face that are across this pantheon of, of, of needs and support, if that's the case, do you have the right partners in place that help you address the needs of those, of those learners? And if not, then where can you find them? And I think that's something that's um, often missed is that many organizations attempt to do all of this themselves um, and, and find themselves unable um, to do that. So that's something we can spend a little time digging into, but I want that to be very clear that that's the vision and the theory of action that's, that's guiding this work is that we anticipate that the needs um, of opportunity are going to be very different based on their ability to take up opportunities and the degree of preparation they have. And that it's incumbent upon us as providers and as grant structurers to be able to identify those obstacles, those challenges, those lost points, and those opportunities that allow communities to determine what needs there are and how to address them. 
There are some additional elements as well. Um, first is community ownership. The expectation is that communities should have a sense of ownership and participation in the design and implementation of career pathway systems. Developing career pathway systems is hard. It's hard and arduous work, and unless you have a local buy-in, it's very difficult to get the kind of employer and community-based organization voice that you need in order to do it well. Um, the co-ownership of partners at the local and regional level helps to build that capacity among local actors to build those regionally responsive programs and to build mechanisms for sustainability. So that community ownership is facilitated um, by a connection to other communities that are doing this work to learn from best practices and collectively overcome hurdles, which is part of the impetus for us to do a community of practice with this grant, and we'll spend some time talking about that later. Um, we're also focusing on consortia models, um, and m many folks have asked, um, what's the difference between consortia and partnerships? Um, by partnerships, it assumes that there's, um, to a certain extent, an, an owner of this work. Um, with a consortium model, you're really trying to focus on um, co-ownership and trying to think about how you consolidate, consolidate partners who are often servicing very similar constituencies and or connecting with the same partners and employers. Um, joining forces towards that common cause really helps to avoid many issues of program overlap um, and can concentrate a community's focus for greater impact on a very particular problem. And that's something I think that as we, as we contemplate how we write it, um, it really needs to be very problem oriented. There's also the issue of youth ownership, and I've mentioned this before, um, that this is something I'd like us to maybe spend some time digging into for those of you who feel comfortable um, talking about this, is that the young people should be given an opportunity to participate fully depending on their level of need, um, and should be provided with some kind of commensurate support to do so. So youth ownership potentially is facilitated by the development of a forum where opportunity youth who demonstrate capacity for leadership are provided with the opportunity to speak for their um, for the opportunity youth community at large and to play a leadership role in that community. Um, we're facing, um, and, and those of you who work in this space recognize as well, the, the work of addressing the needs of opportunity use between the ages of 16 to 24, um, there's a distinct difference between the needs of someone who's 16 and the needs of someone who's 24. Um, and there's a distinct difference in their capacity and their potential for leadership opportunity. And I myself struggle with the notion of this kind of arbitrary cutoff at 24 as a youth, um, and then all of a sudden at 25 you're an adult. Um, and, I, and I think that as we contemplate and co-create this idea of a youth forum and youth ambassadors, we may think about how we can level, leverage the expertise of our 21 to 24-year-olds to um, play a real leadership role and gain some leadership capacity um, as part of this. And we can spend some time talking about that. I'm, I'm very open and, and flexible on how that might play out, but I think that's something that we are all going to have to, to co-create. Um, there is a question from Kate that our participants who are already have a high school diploma or GED not qualified for funding. Matt, do you want to try to address that? We'll give Matt a minute, um, but I think um, he might be in the best position to help answer that. Um, so I'll just move along, and then when Matt gets a chance to hop on, I think um, we'll be able to do that. Um, Hi, Andrea. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I, was, um, okay. I thought I was talking. I was on mute. That's what I figured. Um, That's what I figured. And so we're addressing Kate's question here? Yeah. yeah. So basically, um, it, no. I, I mean, eligibility for WIOA services is a requirement, Kate. Um, and there are um, eligibility, you know, qualifications for in-school youth and for out-of-school youth, and those are all, um, you know, we are going to entertain at least the funding of um, the funding of uh, applications and projects that um, that address both in-school and out-of-school youth. Uh, we do have a statewide requirement just like all of the local areas do under 
Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act to spend 75% of all dollars allocated to youth on out-of-school youth. Um, so that leaves us only a maximum of a 25% window uh, to handle in-school youth. So um, out-of-school youth are definitely uh, the focus. Uh, we will entertain projects in both directions. Okay, excellent. Um, the last piece of this kind of, oh, um, Kathy, why don't we go ahead and try to address that in a little bit um, as we contemplate work-based learning. Um, I think that's a, that's a good question that we can dig into in a little bit. Um, as a vision and theory of action, kind of the last component is this, is that sector-based strategies and career pathway systems. And there's some confusion about what we mean um, by sector-based strategy. And it looks like my connection was lost, um, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure what happened. Um, I'm going to, if you folks will just give me a moment, I'm going to uh, see if I can hop back in. Um, it's taking a moment. Okay, so hopefully I'm back on. Um, so as we come to talk about sector-based strategies, we're really talking about those initiatives at a regional level that are approaches to um, workforce and economic development that improve access to good jobs and or increase job quality in ways that strengthen an industry workforce. Um, and why is this, this powerful? Um, what, sec what sector initiatives do is they focus intensively on a particular industry within a regional labor market. So for instance, manufacturing. Um, and allow multiple employers to engage um, in that effort over a sustained period of time. Um, they're led by a workforce intermediary with credibility in the industry. And we'll talk a little bit about what we mean by intermediary later. But basically, it's someone who can get employers to show up, who can get them to, to follow through on the work that they've agreed to do, and to act as that convener for that space. Um, they help to create new pathways for low-wage workers into the industry, which lead to good jobs and careers going forward. And then they also help to achieve systemic changes that are essentially a win-win for employers, workers, and the community. So. Um, Attached to that are the notion of, of what do we mean by career pathways, and we already spent some time digging into that. But career pathways are essentially an approach that connects progressive levels of basic skills for secondary education, training, and supportive services, and they do so in specific sectors or cross-sector occupations. They do so in a way that optimizes the progress and success of individuals, including those individuals who um, either have limited English, um, limited education skills, and or work experience. And they do so in a way that helps individuals secure marketable credentials, self-sustaining employment, and further education and employment opportunities. So career pathway programs focus on participant-focused instruction and training. They focus on appropriate and meaningful assessment. And they focus on supportive and services and navigation, as well as direct connections to employment. Sector and career pathways initiatives are complementary, but all career pathways should incorporate a sector strategy principle because it acts as an organizing framework. To create a career pathway system where you have progressive connected courses, training, and work-based learning opportunities to do so across a bunch of sectors means that that student really isn't prepared for much. But if you're able to focus, let's say, on manufacturing, you're able to really hone in on those particular skill sets that a student might need. You give that student a lens through which to view their work, their education, so to create some kind of contextualized um, learning for that, for that education. Um, and it allows you to um, consolidate resources and investments in that field so that you have a much higher likelihood of engaging employers towards work-based learning, internship opportunities, potential apprenticeship opportunities, and, um, and exploration and awareness opportunities as well. So that's kind of the rationale behind that. Um, so this is essentially the picture that I, I had on my bulletin board as I was writing this work. Um, I think those of us who spend time speaking with youth um, or researching or doing some of this work, even in a really abstract sort of way, recognize that what opportunity you have to navigate is a maze of system and influences. Our young people in general have to do this, but many of our young people have the benefit of having, having the resources, whether they're at home or at school, to be able to have some kind of some kind of navigation tool, some kind of navigation assistance. And our opportunity youth, many of whom are either 
homeless, our, our disabled, are facing a myriad of number of obstacles. They're finding themselves having to navigate a maze of system and influences um, and often give up. And it's incumbent upon all of us as we contemplate how we design our programs to give them a system that looks much more like this, where they're at the center of this work and there's connections between the justice system and nonprofits and the business sector and K-12 education system and the philanthropic sector in ways that are much more meaningful than we do them now, in ways that put aside our silos and put aside our need to um, focus on our own organizational um, our own organizational wants and desires and really try to think about how can we better partner, how can we better liaise, and how can we better create consortium models in a particular community so that our opportunity to create a system that looks much more like this. Um, so as far as the vision and theory of action, um, this is kind of where I, I'll stop just for a minute and leave some time open for questions. Go ahead. In terms of the justice system, um, that's kind of where we've had some of our major roadblocks because um, <clears throat> some of the situations that our young people come from aren't necessarily um, uh, able to be tied into the work environment. So if you've got a young person who has a, um, a violent offense, some employers even though this young person is qualified after some training, may not allow that young person a shot. Sure. Um, what are some ways to navigate that specific portion of this, um, you know, kind of network-based approach? Um, well, I'll say this. There are some best practice research models out there for how some of this work is done, and I'm, I'm happy to put some of those on, um, on the WIOA website. Um, truthfully, a lot of that is about building relationships across the community. Um, sure. And, and it's arduous work, and it's a slog, and recognizing that some employers are never going to be okay with it. And, and sometimes it really just does take one champion to be able to address this work. And there, are, there have been some successful models of, um, of work where justice-involved youth are able to find um, some purchase in the workforce going forward, and that allows them as a stepping stone to move into other, other opportunities going forward. I won't say that it's not without its challenges, um, and if that's something that, um, as a community of practice, we may have to start to think much more deeply about. And, and even contemplate um, having some kind of a um, employer summit <laughs> that helps to address mm -hmm. some of the issues mm -hmm. of justice-involved youth, because I think sometimes there are misconceptions um, on the employer's part about the amount of work mm -hmm. that justice-involved youth might be or the amount of liability that they might be taking on. And sometimes it's really just a, a reorientation of HR strategy that allows them to take some of those youth on and that is often a much simpler enterprise than they themselves imagine. So again, <coughs> excuse me, that's something that we may have to contemplate co-creating. Okay. Hi. Hi, this is John Mark here from DRS. Um, can, I, can I ask for a little bit of clarification on the question that was just asked? Is, is, was the real question, how do we identify those employers um, well, not that, would potentially, identify. that would potentially hire well, I think that would, that's that's definitely part of it. You know, okay. from us, we also work in an industry um, in terms of manufacturing that is highly um, accepting of young people with backgrounds because mm -hmm. the need is so great. Um, but there is also a um, a certain understanding that only a certain type of background is 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 acceptable. So if you have young people who have viol who have committed violent offenses versus possession, you know, gotcha. possession of a controlled substance versus a violent offense, someone assumes that that young person is more, you know, the violent offense young person is more liable to be that way at work. Um, when we all know the myriad of things that exist, you know, to, that created that violent offense. 
Um, we run across many of the same things based on the type of disability that sometimes um, not only employers but other, you know, just all, all partners have uh, presumptions about certain types of disabilities that would equate to sometimes more or less problems in a workplace. So I definitely identify with what, where you're going with that. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't know that this helps, um, but I did think I would at least put it out there that we, um, through Division of Rehab, recently have started um, um, a new level of kind of uh, training and engagement for our staff that since um, we really will be working across agency lines with our workforce partners um, a lot closer, have been getting training and education from some of those different workforce partners. And um, one of them that's been really in helpful to us is, is IDES and their labor market economist who have shared information with us um, about different employers that do, in fact, um, hire um, for individuals with with uh, different criminal backgrounds. And so if anything like that would ever be as we're looking at, like, identification of, of any businesses, we'd surely also be happy to try to work that out, too. That's great. Share that information. Was, and that was George Putnam? Is that with the IDES, the labor market folks? Um, it Actually, Ron Payne is the is the manager of that program, I think, and he's got different labor market economists and the different EDRs, and so we've been working okay. pretty close with them. I, I would love to see that, and um, so I'll, I'll reach out to him and, and see if he can't get access to that information. But okay. I, think, I think the broader question, I think this is going to have to be something that maybe we contemplate co-creating as a best practice model, like how do we actually get employers to get on board with some of the the work of developing employability skills and um, and actually hiring um, the opportun opportunities that are justice involved and that have violent um, offenses on their records, um, and that's that I think something that we can we can contemplate going talking about going forward. I don't unfortunately have all the answers to that, but I think that there sure. are some models that we mm -hmm. can look at addressing. Absolutely, so I think it's a great question. It's a great question. What other questions are out there? So I'll say Kathy Evans posted the questions about if all intern apprenticeships have to be paid. Um, as per the dictates of this opportunity, no. Um, so if you're contemplating an apprenticeship program, um, that does not need to be paid. I, I will say this, that a true apprenticeship program, um, the definition of apprenticeship program really is that the, the primary um, relationship is between the employee and the employer, um, and so that the, the, the employee, the student, is essentially um, an employee of that company first, and that the training providers act to help bolster any kind of information that they can't get at the, at the place of employment. So um, while I will say that it, from, from our consideration, there's nothing in there that stipulates that apprenticeships have to be paid, but by, by their very definition, a true apprenticeship is something that should be should have some kind of a remuneration attached to it. And I was going to uh, jump in on that one as well. I was just kind of trying to do like a little bit of last second research here to make sure that nothing additional came out in the regs that um, that, that I have I've missed somehow. But, um, you know, I would just say, Kathy, that, that we certainly see um, you know, as a best practice, uh, you know, some sort of compensation for work-based learning. Uh, we did not specifically write into this funding opportunity, uh, and, um, and programs will not be specifically judged upon whether or not they pay for work-based learning. Um, like I said, though, it is considered a best practice, and, um, you know, it, it, as far as uh, the kind of models that um, that, that we've been looking at. Well, I was just, this is Kathy Evans. What I was going to say is uh, it, it isn't so much the compensation as the liability associated within that becomes their employee, and then we have a harder problem getting people to sign on because that same 
area might sign on to be, let's say, a clinical site for a healthcare program because they don't consider that the same type of liability as an actual employee of theirs. And we run into a lot of problems with that, uh, not so much the pay as the liability associated with that is a employee of theirs rather than a student of ours. Uh, if you so are, are you talking, Kathy, specifically about um, registered apprenticeships or are you just talking about work-based learning in general? I'm talking about work-based learning just in okay, general okay. in our area here, yes. Sure, yeah, work-based learning. So, um, I mean, there are ways that, that folks work around that, for instance, taking on, um, you know, taking on uh, the uh, youth as, um, as an employee of the organization that, that is running the program. Um, you know, and so so technically they become the the employer of record uh, at that agency. Um, there there are some ways that that you can kind of address the concerns of the um, the businesses that you're working with and and still provide compensation for for the youth. Um, it's it's definitely something that you know I would I would look into as you're you're in program design and. Um, and we'd be more than happy to talk to you about how some folks address it. Okay, and, thank and you. I'll say, I'll say this, Kathy. There's some really innovative work that's coming out of the IT Learning Exchange and our partners with CompTIA. Um, CompTIA has developed a, a, a framework for work-based learning that's called the Four P's, and it's a way to rethink um, kind of pay, place, project. Um, and personnel, because it may be that an organization, it may be that a business really wants to be able to have students, right? They can pay them, they have a project for them, they even have people to work with them, but they have no place for them to go. Or they have a place, they have people to work with them, and they have a project, but they can't pay them or don't want to pay them because they don't want to be the employer of record. So it's really about rethinking kind of those four Ps, and sometimes you see a case where, let's say, um, I know in Chicago the, there's been a, a, a couple of situations where the Chamber of Commerce has acted as the employer of record and then has essentially hired out these students um, as part of this kind of broader internship um, build-out. And through the, through the project with CompTIA and the early college STEM schools, and, and I'll tell you, it's been very successful. Rethinking about those 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 four components and how we might rethink those, how we might help employers to rethink um, work-based learning if they don't have to take on the whole kit and caboodle. Okay. Can you give me that name again? What was I the name? I will happily give you the name, and I will happily send you all that information and post it on the um, WIOA website. It is the it's CompTIA, and it's the four P's of work-based learning, um, and if you Google it, you may find it, but I will, I will actually give you all the materials. I'll do that um, after we get off the, off the line today. Okay, I'll thank you very much. No, happy to do it, happy to do it. So, I mean, it really, some of it's about being creative about, yeah. about this work and recognizing that employers have their own set of hurdles they have to jump over, and sometimes they just don't have either the capacity or the desire to take on a certain level of responsibility, and that has to be okay with us. Right, and they, a lot of times that's when they shut down on us. That's when, we, that's when they when they check out, you know. That, so. And that makes sense. That makes sense. If they're just not positioned to do that, if they're not positioned to handle it, then I think then I think maybe it's incumbent upon us to take a step back and say, okay, well, then where, where are you positioned to engage with these students? And let's start you there and then build a relationship from there. So that, okay. that, may, be, that may be something. I'll, I'll post some, some resources on that. Okay, what thanks. other questions? No, no problem. What other questions are there from folks? Anything lingering? All right. Why don't we go ahead and keep moving forward, but if there are other questions, you can either post them in the chat box and then we'll address them as we can, or just say I have a quick question and you can speak up. So we're going to spend a little time now talking about some real specific expectations of the notice of funding opportunity. Um, and if I'm going to toggle over to it here in a minute. I'm not yet Chelsea, but I'm going to toggle over to a minute. If you have the supplement, um, for the um, for the opportunity that's actually on the, on the link, um, and that's this particular one. This is the agency specific content, and this is where you have the logic model, where you have your toolkit, and you have your um, 
you have your measurements as well as the action plan framework. Um, we're going to spend a little time digging into that. Chelsea, do you mind flipping us back over to the, um, the PowerPoint? All right, here we go. So here are some of the core components to this work. Um, we um, are really focused on the development of a series of components, and that is really meant as a way to build um, to build an action plan that can be used to benchmark progress and highlight milestones. And we're doing those through three core things, and that's through a logic model, um, a career pathways toolkit, and then the development of an action plan. So let's dig into the logic models first. Um, and we're going to spend a little time digging into it and talking about it. But functionally, what logic models help organizations do is they help them define what short and long-term goals are. They help them think about what are the inputs, what are you investing, what are your staffing time, your funding, your technology, what, what, what are some of the things that you're inputting into this work? What are your outputs? Um, what are you doing? What are your activities and interventions that you're contemplating? Um, are there some external factors that you can identify, things that you simply can't control and you know you can't control them? Um, and then what are some of the assumptions that you have that you already know? So what is some of the existing knowledge that you have that helps you build this? So this is a logic model, pretty simple, that we're having all organizations, all, all program applicants do. Um, and essentially start with a problem statement. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? Um, I think so often we get really tangled up in the minutia of the work that we're trying to do that we forget to take a step back and think about what is it that we're actually trying to solve for here as we're contemplating all this work. And that's something I want that to be for the 8 to 12 um, applicants that end up getting funded as part of this work. I want that to be front and center in the work that they choose to engage in. And I want that to be the, the, the thing that we come back to every month as we, as we get on our monthly calls. Um, and what are some of the program goals? What are the goals that you have, and you as a collective you, um, what are the goals that you have um, as part of this work? Um, what are the resources? So what do you have to work with? Um, what are some of the things that you bring to the table that you as a collective, as a consortium, bring to the table? Um, and then that's where you're going to start to build out your activities, your outputs, your short-term outcomes, your intermediate outcomes, and your long-term outcomes, right? And when we talk about short-term versus long-term, it's the difference between what we expect to occur in the short-term, what we want to see after that, and what we hope to see over time. Um, because if we're not able to have a kind of a vision, like if we're doing all these interventions, what do we hope will happen in the future? If we're not, we don't have that kind of in mind. It makes it very difficult for us to plan for any kind of future work. So this logic model is, is incredibly crucial um, and, and something that really does need to be developed in a cross-sector way. Um, next is we're going to spend a little time talking about process measures and the development of evaluation tools. And I'm not sure if Brian Richard is, oh, he is on the phone. Okay, excellent. Um, so we have Brian Richard on um, the webinar, and as I mentioned earlier, um, he is with NIU Center for Governmental Studies and is helping us think about an evaluative structure for this work, in part because this is not only a pilot program for the participants, it's also a pilot program for DCO. Um, as they contemplate how they're going to move this work forward in the future, they are thinking about a different way of evaluating the work that applicants actually engage in. Um, and that's, so that's part of what you're doing here is those folks that are selected as, um, as grantees will actually be helping us co-create an evaluative structure for work going forward. Um, that being said, these, these programs do need to be measured on something. And so we have a variety of measures, first of which is process measures. So those process measures are those that will help us to determine what processes are most important for the development of a model which supports the goal of this pilot period. And the goal of the pilot period is to develop an approach which supports regions to work collectively using career pathways models to address opportunity use needs. Pretty simple. But that's the goal that is kind of driving my work. Um, and so that's, that's part of the reason for these process measures. And when we talk about process measures, we kind of bucket them in these three things. First is the participation in a community of practice. 
I have had the distinct pleasure of working um, with multiple organizations in multiple different types of community of practice. And I find what I find the most potent and powerful aspect of that work is the peer-to-peer -peer learning that occurs. Um, and so what we're asking folks to do as part of this is that program leads identify one lead to act as some kind of a program emissary on a monthly call and then biannual meeting. Um, and those will likely be in-person meetings. Um, the second is that program emissary participates regularly in the community of practice monthly calls and in those biannual meetings. Not just the identification, but the actual active participation in that peer-to-peer -peer learning network. The next is the youth participation in, in something that I'm calling the Opportunity Youth Ambassador Program, but we can absolutely <laughs> contemplate changing that name. Um, but it's, the, it's where program leads identify two Opportunity Youth to Act Program Ambassadors and that those program ambassadors participate regularly in monthly calls and in biannual meetings. And then also um, that they're able to present some of their work at some point to the IWIB Standing Youth Committee. And the third is the development of a continuous improvement plan. Um, and many of us who do our work do this already, but some of us don't. Um, some of us don't benchmark against our work. Um, and this, this, the hope of this work that we're doing here is that this will become a habit um, over the course of time. So program leads um, are anticipated to provide a continuous improvement plan by the end of the second quarter of the grant, and there will be a tremendous amount of technical assistance that goes into that um, after grant awards have been made. Um, program leads provide regular updates on the continuous improvement plan during monthly calls, and that continuous improvement plan is used to develop an interim report at the end of 18 months. Are there any questions about this? Um, I'm going to just pop back here because I think it, it's incredibly incumbent upon us all to recognize that those process measures will go hand in hand with VOA youth performance measures. Um, and, and Matt can speak to this better than I can. But any money that's used, that's, any VOA money that's used from the federal government does have um, the VOA youth performance measures attached to that. And I think most of you are, are intimately aware of those, of what those are. Um, but we will work. Part of our struggle and part of our intent is to work with you to contemplate how we balance the need to measure against those performance measures and the need to ensure the capacity for innovation and creativity in the delivery of, of new types of services and new types of career pathway system development. We recognize that career pathway system development is a long game. It's, the, it's, not, it's not about the short game, it's the long game. So some of, a great deal of the work that you are anticipated to do over the course of the 12 to 18 months is really about laying some real foundation for this work going forward. Um, so we are going to have to be very creative, which is why we've asked Brian Richards to, to partner with us on this work and why we're going to be partnering with, um, with all of the, the grantees, again, 8 to 12. Um, to make sure that we're being as conscious to the needs to evaluate a gust, both of those things simultaneously. Are there any questions about that? This is Brian. I'll just say a couple things here. Um, when, when we're talking about evaluation here, it's not that we're trying to grade you on what you're doing. It's, try, it's that we're trying to learn from these innovative programs and trying to figure out how we can take these and apply them in, in other parts of the state, other parts of the country. So uh, I think in, in most ways, maybe this whole process is us all learning together as we go through this and uh, trying to figure out the best ways of approaching these types of programs. So that, that's the main evaluation goal of the, the program. All right. This is uh, Kathy Evans. I do got another question. <laughs> uh, how will we be evaluated? Like uh, some parts of the state, uh, we're from the southern part of the state, Rand Lake is. Our opportunities will not be probably as high paying that we will offer as uh, some areas of the state might have more advantageous positions just in what is surrounding them. Will that necessarily go against us in the writing of this grant that we may have uh, career pathways that are in this area that are not as highly paid as, let's say, somebody farther north in the state, even when you take into effect 
the, the difference in locations just by virtue of the fact of what we have here to offer our people. If we consider, we could say they would be mobile and move to the north, but that most necessarily probably is not what we're going to consider here. Will that uh, score us lower, I guess is what I'm saying? Not at all. Okay. Not at all. We're looking for, I mean, I'll say this, and I, I'm sure Matt will reiterate this, the, the things that we're looking for, the, the two key things for me are innovation and partnerships, 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 partnerships. It's okay. less for me about what students are being paid and less and more for me about how are you working across your community to make sure that the needs of those, the opportunities that you're trying to address are being fully done so across community partners, and that includes employers. Okay. Um, and so, I mean, I think for, for as we contemplate kind of quote unquote grading these, um, we're really looking for innovation and partnership. And Matt, I don't know if you want to add to that. No, I would just say um, that, you know, the, um, you know the, the one thing that we are looking for when it comes to the quality of the work opportunities is that the pathways that you guys are pursuing align with, you know, what is what the growth pathways are in your geography. And that's pretty much the only thing that we'll be looking at in terms of um, the relationship between um, the, the pathways that you offer in your geography. Okay. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Thanks for asking, Kathy. Anyone else? Any other questions? Okay. We'll move on. Um, so I, I think this visual, I love this visual. We <laughs> talk about the need to develop a logic model. Um, because the one way we're contemplating evaluation is that there, that pilot programs will be assessed on their ability to follow through on those activities outlined in their action plan that are directly aligned to the needs identified in the development of their career pathway self-assessment tools and the outcomes identified in the development of their logic model. So even though it seems like we're asking you to do a lot of things with these three components, there is a method to our madness um, in that the logic model really helps, if you look at this, this, this um, slide, by identifying those resources, activities, outputs, and outcomes, we're able to identify and evaluate process by looking at your activities and your outputs. Um, nothing drives me crazier than having to report outcomes after six months on a grant. Um, I don't have any outcomes after six months on a grant. I have nothing to report outcomes. I have process to report. And that's what I want to see us report back on. I want us to see, I want us to see are we engaged in the community of practice? Do we have youth involved? Um, do we have a continuous improvement plan in place? Are we are we fulfilling? Are we following through on the things that we identified as being part of our action plan? Um, and then eventually, you you evaluate outcomes and you look at the indicators for those outcomes and the data collection process thereof. Right. So this evaluation tool for future programs will really be co-created um, with programs as part of the pilot process. And I, I hopefully this allows you to see kind of the method behind the madness of of having you do all three of those things. Um, the next thing we're going to do, um, and we'll toggle over to the to the, the toolkit in a moment, but what we're going to do is really spend a little time talking about the Career Pathways Toolkit. And, and you'll see on the top it says Catalyst for Community Organization. And that's partially because that's what I want this to be. Whether or not you get this grant, this tool can be a real catalyst for community organization around career pathway system development. And career pathway systems can be a very powerful tool for aligning resources and investments towards the end of increasing the post-secondary outcomes for students in a community, whether they're opportunity use or not. Um, and so this tool really allows for some self-assessment of how your organization and how your consortia how the proposed program meets the core elements that are identified and will be used in order to assess pro progress and continuous improvement um, in program evaluation during the life of the grant. The tool uses um, basic and advanced criteria that help to identify which stage um, a particular um, system is at. Um, and I want to make sure this is really clear, which is why it's in bold red. Um, there will be no value judgments that are made based on the stage of development of a particular career pathway system or career pathway program. The program applications will be based 
um, and will be assessed on the development of the tool and the action plan in relation to those elements. So essentially, the more time you spend in developing this toolkit, the more partners that are involved, the deeper you dive into really being truthfully honest and, and having a real honest assessment about where you're at and where you're planning to mitigate some of the things that you're not doing well, that's what we want to see. And that's what we're going to, to, to be assessing against. There will be zero value judgments. If you're not very highly developed in some elements, we anticipate that. Um, and we expect that. And there will be no value judgments that are made based on kind of the level of, of degree of preparation for a particular element. So this tool will be can use in conjunction with technical assistance sessions that are going to be held throughout um, the application period and then will also be used as a continuous improvement resource throughout the life of the grant. So let's go ahead and toggle over to the, let me just flip to the next slide to make sure I'm not, oh, yeah, you know, let's talk about this first. As people keep asking, um, I've had this question asked a few times uh, about, about development um, of the tool and, and if a particular organization can do this, this um, tool by themselves. And I will say my answer to that is no. Um, this tool needs to be developed with cross-sector partners, including employer partners, including local workforce innovation boards, including local development agencies if that's different from the IWIS, um, including an area chamber of commerce or some kind of a similar private association of businesses, your education partners, and that includes your community colleges, your school district and you're participating for your universities as is appropriate to the system in question. Um, and then also participating community-based and or faith-based organizations. Um, it's incredibly important that you contemplate how those cross-sector partners are going to come together to, to, to actually work on this toolkit. But this toolkit can actually be a catalyzing effort um, for the purposes of the work that we're trying to do. Um, so I'm going to have you toggle over, Chelsea, to the to the actual um, supplement itself, if you don't mind. So let me just pop this open. So I'm going to actually scroll down. Oh, okay. I'm going to scroll down because I want to make sure that we are we're identifying kind of how these core elements are separated. So we have these core elements separated into two separate things. We have them separated into program elements and backbone elements. Um, and, and we do so because there's a recognition that while you can build a great program, if you don't have the backbone to support it, it's not likely to be able to sustain itself. It's not likely to be able to actually move forward in any kind of comprehensive way. Um, so let's go ahead and just dig into this a little bit. So first we have the Career Pathways backbone. Um, and this is really focused on partnerships, business engagement, measuring results and continuous improvement. And this is really, um, oh, and, and sustainability. So when we're talking about partnerships, we're talking about kind of are there partners um, who will plan and commit to leveraging resources? And will they do so in order to educate, train, support, and or identify employment opportunities for youth? Are those partners engaged on the ground? Um, is there business engagement? Do employers play some kind of a leadership role in developing and managing um, career pathways programs? And do they do so in a way that ensures that the careers that are in demand at the local and regional and or state level are, are being addressed, that content is current, and that there are workplace learning opportunities that are offered throughout the Pathways experience? Um, is there a continuous improvement plan and is there a capacity to measure results? So are there are Pathway programs measuring results? Um, on indicators and benchmarks, and are they using them in order to improve performance to remain responsive? to the needs of pathway participants and to the needs of the business community. And finally, um, is there some kind of a sustainable funding mechanism to keep the project running beyond the term of the grant? Is this plan part of a broader and long-term public and private human resources strategic commitment? Um, and that's, that's kind of one of the, the things that I always want to try to suss out when we're talking about employer and private participation, that is this is this plan to build career pathway systems kind of part of a broader HR strategy? Is it kind of part of a broader public strategy to actually improve economic development at the community level? And if it's not, you're not as likely to see as much success going forward if, it, if, if you don't have those pieces in place. So let's just take a little time to dig into some of these components. Now, when we've had folks in in-person technical assistance sessions, we've actually had 
community teams come together and spend a little time working on this toolkit. We have also had chances for people to kind of do some um, speed dating um, <laughs> across some of these elements. So we'll, we'll do what we can to address some of the, the needs um, of, this, of this kind of webinar listening session. Um, but first, let's just spend a little time um, talking about these elements. Um, so as you can see here, and we'll just take partnerships as an example, there are some basic program criteria and advanced program criteria. And then there are some edit evidence um, or points of artifacts that might help to clarify if those criteria exist. So for instance, in basic program criteria, partnerships include secondary and post-secondary education employers, workforce development boards. And partners commit to collaborating in the development and administration of a career pathway program. And it could be that you have some kind of a memorandum of, of, of understanding that helps to clarify what some of those roles look like. Um, there could be a statement of need that has been developed as part of that partnership. Um, it, it, could be, it could be something relatively simple. In advanced program criteria, um, you can have, it's where partner roles and relationships are defined, and there's a work plan that's developed um, in collaboration across partners. Um, an MOU or other agreement has been drafted and signed that binds agencies to long-term support of career pathway. Um, partners take ownership in the development, improvement, and outcomes and performance of pathway programs. They leverage resources to implement pathway programs, and they meet on a regular basis in order to share the work, identify new opportunities, and consider ways to expand their collaboration. So there's multiple ways you can show evidence of that, and it can be Again, an MOU, it can be statements of need, it can be a partner provider checklist, proposed scope of work or budget. There are multiple ways that you can show evidence for these partnerships um, more broadly. Um, so this kind of gives you a sense as to as you contemplate your current status and identify needs to really think about where are we doing some of this work well? Where do we need to maybe get more partners on board? Um, are we missing folks? Who else needs to be part of that? And have we actually developed a statement of need? And if not, let's go ahead and do that. So really being honest um, and assessing where you're at with partnerships, I think that, that allows you to think about, about that work. So you'll see the same goes for business engagement, um, measuring results in continuous improvement methodology and sustainability. When we contemplate career pathway program elements, these are the elements that are focused on education and training, foundational disciplines and employability skills, and learning by doing. And, and those elements have been identified as work-based learning experiences, credentials, certifications, and or post-secondary access, high demand industries that result in high skill occupations, um, individual career and employment plans, are they used in conjunction with those programs? individual support, and then contextualized learning and foundational workplace skills. So this seems like a lot, but essentially is that this, does this pathway actually address all of those things? And we can unpack them a little bit, a little bit if that's helpful. So when we're talking about workplace learning experiences, and this kind of gets to Kathy's point earlier, is that does this, does this career pathway system include opportunities to experience the workplace? And is that through related paid or unpaid internships? apprenticeship, student organization activities, or capstone projects? Are they micro-internships? There are multiple ways to contemplate how work-based learning actually exists. Um, but do those experiences actually provide for the opportunity to increase foundational skills? Um, one thing, and I'll, and I'll just say this, and I say this to employers as well, that, that um, I always find a little curious is when employers say, we just want people that have really good foundational skills, that, that they know how to show up to work on time, and they know how to get dressed appropriately but they don't see that they themselves have a role to play in actually addressing some of those skills. The best way to learn foundational skills is to do so in the workplace. And um, is there a way then, as we think about building workplace opportunities, to have employers play a really active role in the development of those foundational skills? Um, secondly, with credentials, certification, and our post-secondary access. And here's where we're specifically talking about um, a credential that consists of some kind of industry recognized credential or certification, a uh, certificate of completion of an apprenticeship, some kind of a license recognized by a state or federal um, government, or an associate or bachelor's degree with opportunity to obtain advanced standing throughout the pipeline, like early college credit. Right, so we're not just talking about a, a credential, some short-term credential. We're really talking about across the spectrum of opportunities that students can, can, can attach themselves to. Does this system actually 
address those needs and does so in a way that allows students to gain them over time. Um, high demand industries that result in high school occupations, do the Career Pathway programs address those high demand industries that meet state, regional, and local youth earning goals and provide career advancement opportunities um, to higher skill and higher earning jobs. Um, Based on those career information access, are individual career and employment plans developed by participants who enter pathway programs? Do they outline the individual goals and path of coursework and experience needed to, needed to attain those goals? Right? So does, does a student walk into this kind of pathway system knowing I have to check off these things across the board? I have to actually be able to address these particular points on my plan? in order to achieve the goal that I've set for myself? Um, and are there some kind of comprehensive set of support services available to meet the individual needs of those students in order to get to those goals? Um, and finally, contextualized learning and foundational workplace skills. Um, and this is something that I, I think is a, a little bit harder to contemplate and, and to build into these, is that is there a primary focus on the development of foundational skills in the application of learning with integrated content? Um, as we contemplate how we might learn healthcare skills, are we able to learn numeracy and literacy skills through healthcare through a healthcare lens? Are we contextualize learning in such a way that allows students to see relevance for those particular skills that they're trying to build? Um, is instruction related to real world, real life situations and experiences? Um, that's an incredibly important component, and there's some really excellent best practice models that allow you to think about this. And I'm, I'm thinking about, um, I'm, let me pull up your name here. I'm thinking about um, Ray Fleming. I'm thinking about your work um, as you're contemplating building out construction programs. Um, I'm thinking about the course um, Geometry and Construction, which is a really innovative course um, that connects the geometry course with the construction course. And this is for all students. Um, and it actually allows students to, to, to do their mathematics work um, and then go out and apply it by building. Uh, and I think uh, innovative programs like that allow us to think about how we're contextualizing our education in such a way that we provide immediate relevance for students so that they don't feel quite so disconnected from what they're learning, and it provides immediate payoff for them um, in such a way that they're able to actually build their skill sets much earlier. Uh, and that's just a, that's just a, a, a very simple example. Um, and I'm just going to take a second here um, to look at Kathy's question, and I may I may I may address this um, in a little bit, Kathy. Um, let me just get through this, and then we'll go ahead and address that. So again. Same kind of format. It's basically looking at the elements, the basic program criteria, the advanced program criteria, and then what are some of the evidence that you have to show that, that you've actually addressed some of those needs. So what the purpose of this is, is really allowing you to work with community partners, to work across the system, to think about what are we doing well to address this problem that we've identified in our logic model? What are we doing well? What are we not doing well? Where do we need to do more work? Um, and where do we need to find more partners to address this? Um, all of this is going to allow you to build out your action plan. I'm going to kind of scroll through that. Because what you've done by identifying all your needs, by identifying your current set of and your needs, what you're able to do then is you're able to think about what are some of the action steps that you're going to take, um, what will be done. So now that you've identified the needs, you're able to think about how do we plug those, those holes. Um, and this is where you're going to identify your action steps, um, who's going to do it, what the timeline is, what are your resources, who are your partners, um, are there particular challenges or barriers that you anticipate before you even go into this, how you're going to communicate this task or step to your partners, um, and, and not only to your partners, but to the broader public at large, um, and then what will this task or step accomplish. So um, Chelsea, if you don't mind um, toggling back to the PowerPoint, we can spend a little time digging into that, and I'm just going to kind of see where we're at here. So again, this is the action plan. Um, I'm going to address Kathy's question here in a minute, but are there any questions about the actual structure of the toolkit, 
the logic model, the action plan, anything that I can help answer. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and try to address Kathy's question. So her question is, what is considered a long-term commitment? Many of community partner organizations are running on a short-term budget, budget and hesitant, are hesitant to longer term due to lack of future budget assurances. Um, so Kathy, I will say this. For me, the development of a system is about getting partners to see this as something that will address their collective needs um, in the long term. And being able to partner with organizations that have similar goals and similar um, intended outcomes. Um, and that includes your workforce development, that includes your municipal leaders, that includes, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's really about finding those partners that are willing to work with you in a consortia to get to collective goals. And I know that does not do a very good job of answering your question. Um, I would say that I think that's something that you have to suss out on a case-by-case -case basis. If, if an organization says, I'm only willing to commit to you for a, a year, um, I, I think then that's something that you have to feel out and um, um, are, you have to be willing to, to mitigate that by, by enabling that relationship to continue in the future. Um, but I'm not sure I can answer that in any kind of really comprehensive way other than to say that partnership work and relationship work is, is a long, hard slog. And that's why plugging into the community um, and really making sure that this is part of a broader public strategy is going to be so important. Matt, do you want to try addressing that as well? Uh, I, I would just add, um, and this is a, I don't, I don't know if this is the intention of, of this question you know so I, I, I don't I just I just want to say very generally that um, the intent of making sure that we're requiring all this additional work around the establishment of partnerships and uh, continuous improvement plans and sustainability plans especially in in the case that we're talking about now the sustainability plan the intent of this is that we are not giving money for pilots that exist in a vacuum, that we're um, only funding pilots that have a plan for sustainability beyond the life of the grant fund. So um, any partnerships that apply with the intent to um, just you know, do a short-term program that exists in the lifespan of whatever pilot we, um, whatever pilot we fund and then ceases to exist or ceases to develop beyond that or sustain beyond that, this isn't uh, uh, an opportunity for, for that project. Um, this opportunity is only to fund projects that have a plan for sustainability beyond the life of the pilot. Does that help address your question, Kathy? Yes, that's fine. I was just wondering because a lot of our uh, state funding agencies that we partner with, there, even our uh, WIOAs, their money comes can come and go. You know what I mean? Uh, just to say. Of course, yeah. No, and Kathy, and Kathy, we're not asking you to come to us in your application with an ironclad, um, you know, contract that says that they're going to fund this project out to 2019. What we are asking is that um, you're coming in with. Uh, you know, a, a formal agreement that the intent is to continue to fund, um, you know, this this project if successful um, beyond the life of the, the the pilot project. Okay, that's fine. Are there any other questions before I go on a little bit? Okay. Door is open. Um, there are also some specific project requirements that I want to spend a little time digging into. And you'll find those um, really highlighted on pages 10 and 11 of the opportunities. Um, first is that applicants are highly, and I'm, I wish I could underline it right now, highly encouraged to participate in the consortium. Um, 
If the applicants choose not to apply as a member of a consortium, they need to explain their rationale, including the description of their access to eligible targeted populations, their ability to provide um, education, training, and supportive services, and establish relationships with employers for work-based learning placements, and eventual unsubsidized employment. Okay? Um, so it, it has got to be some, um, uh, there's got to be a capacity to address the needs of opportunity use outside of that consortium, and, and it's highly unlikely that that actually is, is, is the case for most. Um, applicants also need to include a labor market analysis and sound data that illustrates both the needs of business and opportunity use to find points of connection. I say this recognizing how difficult it is to find the data on opportunity use. My assumption is that most of you who work with opportunities or work with partners who work with opportunities have access to some of that data um, that, that you've, you yourself have cultivated and have worked on um, and then have access to some of that work more broadly. Um, labor market analysis, um, a lot of that was done as part of the WIOA regional planning process and everyone has access to that um, on Illinois WorkNet and I'm happy to post a link to that. Um, on uh, our, our website on, on Illinois WorkNet. Um, applicants also need to clearly describe any elements of their projects um, that they consider innovative um, with supporting evidence and specific intended outcomes. Um, and that's really thinking about kind of what are you doing to think outside the box? Who are you partnering with that will allow you to do that? Um, and we need to see some supporting evidence and specific intended outcomes to that effect. Priority consideration is also going to be given to regional projects that develop innovative programs and strategies that are designed to meet talent pipeline needs of businesses um, that will identify and document um, partnerships with regional intermediary who will act as the go-between to coordinate work of the separate partners in the initiative and um, that will develop innovative programs that identify activities to improve linkages and alignment between workforce partners. So let me unpack the first two. Um, developing innovative programs and strategies designed to meet the needs of talent pipeline needs of businesses can be something like bridge programs, customized training, on-the-job training, internships, and work experiences and targeted career pathways. When we're talking about a regional intermediary, I'm going to give you an example, um, or at least a visual, always helps me think about what role an intermediary might play. Um, the left shows kind of our current situation in many cases. I think multiple arrows, all good intentions, and often heading in complete opposite directions. What an intermediary does is it makes the connections between organizations, it manages day-to-day -day items, it acts as the backbone organization for that activity that initiative. So priority consideration will be given to those applicants that have documented a partnership or have identified a regional intermediary who will act as that go-between to coordinate the work of the separate partners in the development of the career pathway system. All right. So um, we are not going to be able to do, and I did not fix this on the slide. Um, we're not going to be able to do this um, kind of community individual time with the toolkit. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend a little time talking about where do we see some areas for potential alignment? What are some things that have kind of um, what that have kind of come out of this that are that are raising some questions for you? Are there someone on the line that you think, oh, I'd like to partner with that person? And I, I really encourage those of you who are on the phone to try to to try to talk and or type in the chat box in the event that you can't talk. Anyone want to get started? Okay, I will. Thank you. <laughs> this is John Marchiaro from DRS. Okay. I would just say something that kind of stands out. I think we've maybe talked about it before on one of the last calls was that we have um, we have seen with our youth that they will transition from high school and then for whatever reason um, they sort of fall off that cliff and out of services um, 
and then re-enter um, one of our partner agencies a year or two afterwards. And um, they've been away from support. They've been away from, from employment. And they really are in need of our help. I think that would be, um, I know that when I've talked with our leadership before, that was one area that we thought might be pretty helpful for for us. So even if they're not coming, you know, it, it's kind of a different group, I think. Um, while we do have, um, a, you know, a, a, a high amount of individuals coming and transitioning out of high school who've been receiving these supports, there's also this sort of subgroup that really has been kind of disconnected and um, might be good to consider when re-entering back in as a possibility, still within that, you know, under 25 area. Sure. So as you're contemplating kind of innovative approaches, and you know, I mean, thinking about how to, how to actually mitigate that group, that subgroup, from becoming disconnected in the first place. Um, and thinking about um, kind of as they're transitioning from high school, what are some support services that can be used to keep them engaged so that they make that transition to post-secondary access? I'm assuming that, that that's something that you've contemplated and, and spent some time talking about, but that's something that it strikes me as kind of being a, an opportune moment to connect with them. What are, have well, you some Sure. We, I mean, we've made some changes internally just in the way that we do monitor. Um, sure. So we've we've started some types of monitoring much early on. The fact that we are starting to see a lot more um, pre-employment transition services starting to, to be implemented now really helps because um, I think it it gets um, more frequent. Um, uh, sort of FaceTime happening with those individuals while they while they still are in high school, and I think sure. that's that can be a problem sometimes. I mean, we hear many times, and and it's it, it's the truth. If 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 you're not making connections, the 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 youth is not going to have any reason to continue to engage with you after they, you know, exit the exit one program and potentially go into another. So they really have to see a lot more. I think consistent. Outreach, and I think that's something that we've we've tried to work on quite a bit. Um, but you know, it, I mean, it still happens. So I think um, we just want to be able to look at that group. I mean, the supports are obviously there for those who continue. We have um, we have individuals then go from kind of high school counselors um, that work through our program to adult counselors, and when it works, it works well. Um, and I think some of these opportunities that we're starting to see happen will be will be very helpful, um, but it's it's you know it's not a perfect situation all the time, and we do have people that fall off or or just want to go do other stuff and then come back to us. But typically, it's not because they're saying, "Well, I want to go and I want to go be a part of other supports." <laughs> Usually, if they're leaving, they're leaving to to for for whatever you know other reason to disconnect and then reconnect. So, and I think that some of those individuals will probably, you know, you really talk about some of those some of those foundational skills. I think there either will need to be a sort of a reintroduction or, you know, some just initial type stuff in the first place. So um, I think that might be a consideration is if we're, if we're going to try things like this, what, what is a way where some of those foundational, um, I guess, skills can be practiced maybe bef either before they get into an apprenticeship or having occur, like you said, uh, while they're going through it as well. Does that make sense? I mean, does that? Oh, it, does. it does. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I, I, like the, I like the thinking around that. Um, Christina, you raised your hand. Are you able to speak? Um, I think so. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Okay. Great. Um, go ahead. As with many community colleges, I'm with Run Lake. We go into the call into the high schools to try to recruit and and enroll those students prior to them leaving the high school. Yet mm -hmm. somehow between when they graduate or they finish or they get out here or before their first semester, we've lost them. There's so many that could benefit from these services, but yet they're never really an out-of-school youth because they, while they were still in high school, then we try to enroll them in the post-secondary ed. Is there a, 
a way or a, a other means? I mean, because that's the primary uh, opportunity youth were looking for, right? Is out of school. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll say this: they need to be WIOA eligible as an out of school youth, um, and there's certain parameters of that that they have to be disconnected from education and employment for a certain amount of time. And I think Matt's much more better positioned to speak about that. Um, but I, I mean, I, I'll say this: that I mean. For the purposes of this funding opportunity, the, the primary target is out-of-school youth. 25% um, of funds can be used for um, in-school youth. Um, but I, I think it's maybe a, a situation whereby connecting with community partners will allow you to identify who the opportunity youth are that um, are maybe of the highest need in your community. So maybe that you've not yet had a chance to engage with as part of the high school program. Um, and that could help to actually um, bolster a program's success so that other students are able to take better advantage of it. So those partnerships, I think, can, can provide um, much better access, much more open access to some of the, the opportunities that, might, that might, um, you might be interested in working with. Matt, well, you want to talk about some of that, too? Can can I kind of can you refresh me on the question? I just want to make sure that I'm answering. So it, the school may I mean they may have been identified as an at risk youth or something in high school, but we are getting them enrolled in college. There may be a, a certificate program or something, um, but yet they're not success as successful in community college as they could have been. Had we been able to enroll them in something such as this, where we have the supports, where they live, leave the safety of high school and come over, I don't know. There's just never that time where they're an out-of-school youth. Right. And, and so out-of-school youth eligibility goes like this before we go uh, in. And this is probably going to only partially answer your question. But out-of-school youth uh, are basically youth that are not attending any school, according to state law. And according to state law refers to school basically and and so what that means is that if it's an individual that is not that is is beyond the age of compulsive schooling in illinois meaning over 17 then it just means exactly that they're, they're not attending any school um, and they are not registered for any kind of post-secondary they don't have a registration an active registration for an upcoming session of post-secondary, then they are out of school. They also have to have a barrier, I should add. Um, that yeah. barrier can be, um, you know, a lot of things, and you'll just kind of have to look at the, um, the eligibility, uh, you know, that we have posted online, or we can, you know, we can, um, you know, the, the wheel of legislation is out there. We can also um, post that, uh, post our eligibility, our state of Illinois, eligibility po policy online so that everybody can see that. But it, it, it's a lot simpler um, this time around than it was under, under WIA. It simply means that they're not attending school and they have some sort of a barrier to employment. Um, if they are uh, of compulsory age, um, then they have to not be attending school for a certain period of time, meaning they have to not be attending school for a calendar quarter. Um, and that's, that's kind of how that goes. If they are registered, if they are actively attending school, or if they are registered for um, either secondary or post-secondary, then they are considered in school. Um, we can, through this funding opportunity, serve both in school and out of school. But like I said before, that comes with certain funding rec uh, restrictions on the state, where we can only spend 25% of our dollars on in-school youth, and this money will follow that. Um, that, that a maximum of, of this money will be used to spend on uh, on in school youth. Um, okay, I've heard, I've heard it both ways. Enrolled in a, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I enrolled in a GED program. Are those students in school or out of school? Uh, enrolled in a an adult education program is um, is a cutout basically. They are considered in school, but for the purposes of WIOA, they're considered out of school. Um, that's a really great question. I should add that any individual that is in a um, youth build program, a dropout reengagement program, or uh, adult education under Title II of WIOA is 
considered um, out of school for the purposes of WEO eligibility. Okay. Thank you for Thank reminding you. me of that. That's a, that's a pretty big yeah. hole in the eligibility. And we'll post, we'll post this on, on the website to make sure that there's, there's some real clarity around this. We'll go into our FAQs. Thank you. Um, no, no problem. Christina, did you type, did you raise your hand again or was that a glitch? You had to take it down. Oh, okay, no stress. Just keep reminding me that your hand is up. Okay. What other questions are there? Anyone else that has any questions? So Ray Fleming um, writes about alternative school enrollment. Matt, do you want to try to address this? The, um, the regulations, Ray, and that's a great question. The regulations that came out this summer, um, you know, we spent the, the first year of this WEO legislation, we spent without the regulations. Um, and the regulations just came out this summer. They addressed alternative schools by removing any reference to alternative schools from the law. Now, what they put in its place, um, it, the reason that they did that, I should say, is because there is no accepted universal definition of what an alternative school is. Um, so I can't give you a clear answer to that because there are different definitions, even within Illinois, as to what an alternative school is. Now. If they're an alternative school um, that is explicitly considered a dropout reengagement program or um, is considered adult education, um, especially adult education um, and, and family literacy under uh, Title II um, of WIOA, then they are explicitly considered out of school. If they are simply diverted into another public school, that is considered um, a quote unquote alternative school, um, but still registered in a secondary school, um, then that uh, can get a little bit dicey and, can, and they can be considered in school. We would have to look at that on a case by case basis and I think that we would probably, um, because you have a specific situation, I think we could, we could probably just kind of, um, if you want to shoot me an email, I'll, I'll post my email address and you can shoot me an email and we'll set up some time to talk offline. How about that? So sure will, Matt. Sure Thanks will. a lot. Great. What other questions are there that we have? Uh, this is Kathy Evans again. <laughs> uh, the question I have is on the, uh, is, is there a ideal, what not ideal, but an idea in mind of what you would consider uh, cost for participants that you would like to, because uh, obviously some participants will take more dollars probably to serve than others. Uh, is there some kind of ratio that is associated with this? Or again, again, does it just depend on the uh, the application itself, how strong you feel like it is? It, it really depends, just depends on, the on the project. Yeah, it depends on the project. We've not really developed any kind of ratio um, of cost per participant. Um, because we feel like it, the, the less uh, restrictions that we put in place on this, the more likely we are to get to get some really innovative approaches to this work. Okay, thank you. The the other issue that we have, Kathy, is that um, you know we're asking for something completely new here. Um, you know, if, if we had done this five or six times, I might be able to come closer to giving you a rule of thumb on this. Um, you know, because we'd have a history and we'd be able to look back empirically at it, but. We just, we're not far enough down this road to see what these kind of programs cost you. Okay. Okay. It's fine. Fine. Um, so kind of identifying some next steps. Um, one thing that would be helpful to both Matt and I, and you're more than welcome to email either one of us um, or both of us, and I'll just post my email address right here, even though it's on the opportunity itself. Is, are there additional opportunities that might be helpful to you? Um, I'm going to um, email this PowerPoint um, out to all of you, um, and you can respond back to that email and just say, you know, as I'm thinking about this, is there is there any information on X 
um, on employer engagement or building work-based learning. I'm going to send out the four P's model. I'm putting that in my notes. Um, but you know, are there other resources that you think might be helpful to you that, that we can help ferret out? And if I don't know the answer right away, we will try. Um, we're also building an FAQ that will be posted in early January um, that will hopefully help to address some of the questions um, that are answered. But again, if a question comes up and there's no answer to it, please do not hesitate to send Matt and I um, that question, and we will do our best to get it answered. Um, there will also be some additional technical assistance offerings. Um, there will be one on developing the logic model. Um, questions and answer sessions, um, there will be one in early January and one in late January. Um, there will also be um, one on employer engagement. Um, and then we're likely going to have launch funding. And applications need to be received no later than 5 o'clock p.m. on February 1, 2017. So are there any questions? kind of for the good of the order that we have um, before folks get ready to sign off and get ready to finish up their Christmas shopping. OK. Um, again, our email addresses are there. Matt and I are very accessible. Um, just shoot us an email. We will do our best to get that answer to you as quickly as possible. If we don't know, we will try to suss it out. Um, and I, uh, I wish everyone a very, very Merry Christmas um, and a happy holidays with your families. Um, and um, it's starting to snow up here in Chicago. Um, so I'm, I'm actually very grateful <laughs> I'm not on the road, but I'm not going to be heading back on the road because I think it would have been a very long trip. So um, I wish everyone very well, and thank you so much for participating. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.